Leaked Russian documents called the Moldova Strategy confirms Putin's plans to destabilize Moldova and bring them back into his sphere of influence by 2030. Moldova is a small, landlocked nation between Romania and Ukraine that is kind of seen as being torn between Russian and Western influence. The US government has generally considered Moldova together with Georgia and Ukraine as three countries that are seeking greater integration with the West while at the same time coping with Russian forces within their territories and separatist conflicts that have been fostered by Russia. So what do these documents reveal about Russia's overall grand strategy and their own perspective on how events are unfolding in the region? Colonel, I've infiltrated the enemy base. I'm gonna switch from noise isolation mode to awareness mode on my Raycons with a quick earbud tap so I can hear you and in case any enemies try to sneak up on me. Ah, here's one now. Who a strike? Cappy Snake, did the crystal clear sounding Raycon earbuds fall out just now? Negative, Colonel. The custom gel tips give me a perfect in-ear fit so I can judo chop and combat roll without having to worry about losing comms. Now I can see why Raycon Everyday Earbuds have over 50,000 five-star reviews. This mission should take you about eight hours to complete, which is exactly how long the battery life is for your Raycons. Good, I like to listen to podcasts about YouTuber drama while I should be focusing on the mission. Wait, we have a problem, sir. I get incredibly sweaty due to my extra arm hair insulation. Will this sweat interfere with our comms? No, don't worry, dummy. They're water and sweat resistant, even to you. Well, I know I'm ready to buy something with a big impact, sir. As soon as this mission's over, I'm gonna click the link in the description box or go to buyraycon.com slash task and purpose to get 15% off my Raycons. On March 14th, Moldovan Prime Minister Doran Rysian took one look at the Moldova strategy leaked documents and said, the Russians have tried for a very long time to make sure Moldova does not have sovereignty over its foreign policy. Meanwhile, Putin accused Ukraine of staging a false flag Russian invasion of Moldova in order to give Ukraine the green light to invade. Last time I checked, Ukraine is not the one invading their neighbors. This is where Transnistria comes into the picture. It's a small pro-Russian territory in eastern Moldova bordering Ukraine that also happens to identify as an independent country, but no one else recognizes this. I'd like to identify as an independent nation myself as Capinistria. There, now I don't have to pay taxes anymore. Just last week, Moscow backed Transnistrian authorities who claimed they arrested two terrorists who had planned to assassinate the president of Transnistria, blaming Ukraine for the plot. But it gets more complicated than that. In early February of this year, Russia rescinded an official decree from 2012 that guaranteed Moldova's sovereignty, essentially saying they no longer respect Moldovan government's rights to independent or territorial integrity. And this comes shortly after Ukrainian President Zelensky warned that Russia was seeking to force out Moldova's pro-Western leadership. But why does Moldova even matter in the first place? The United States has been committed to a policy of Europe being free and having democracy if they want it. Moldova is unfortunately a very poor nation, the poorest in Europe, which makes it vulnerable to corruption. Jamie Kerchik of the Brookings Institute said the following at a June 4th, 2019 briefing of the Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe. He told the US government that he believes the Russian goal in Moldova is not necessarily to even get the country back under their fold, but to completely destroy any possibility of them joining the EU. Russia's real goal, according to him, is to create failed states on the edges of Europe, to create countries that are basically black holes of corruption, arms dealing, and worse. But it gets worse because less than one week after leaked Russian Moldova strategy documents, police in Moldova recently arrested seven people of Russian-backed provocateurs. These men were paid $10,000 each and trained to organize mass disorder and unrest during a protest against Moldova's new pro-Western government. 10K to protest, I'd do it for five. I mean, a ruble's a ruble. But to complicate matters from the other side of the perspective, we need to add some nuance here because these protesters have agency. They're against the pro-Western government for a reason. The pro-Western government has declined to use any Russian gas for the first time in its post-Soviet history. This means that the price of heating up their homes skyrocketed and the regular citizens feel that they're paying for it and they want to be reimbursed by the Moldovian government. Or what I really should say
say is those are the two different perspectives here. But why all the debate over such a small piece of territory in a country not even involved in the ongoing war? Well, the answer, like Transnistria itself, is actually a bit strange. And it'll take us back to the end of the Cold War. After the fall of the Soviet Union, the Moldovan Soviet Socialist Republic gained independence, giving us what we now know today as Moldova. While most of the country was thrilled with this newfound freedom, a certain stretch of eastern territory was not, that stretch being Transnistria, an area just larger than the size of Rhode Island that sits between the Dnistria River and the Moldova-Ukraine border. In the late 1980s, the ethnic Russian majority population of eastern Moldova was gravely concerned that Moldova would be unifying with neighboring Romania. To prevent this, the region organized itself as the Prishnovian Moldovan Soviet Socialist Republic, which not only sought to have the longest name possible, but to also remain a part of Russia. Naturally, Moldova did not recognize this breakaway region within its borders, and this sparked massive riots and led to a relatively unknown conflict known as the 1990 Transnistria War, a nearly two-year-long armed conflict between the Moldovan government and the Transnistria Transnistrian Republican Guard. This signaled to Transnistria that if they were going to break off from Moldova, they needed to do it quickly, expecting that the Russian military, due to their ethnic similarities, would be willing to intervene on their behalf. Local Transnistrian government forces prepared defenses around their capital of Trispol, preparing for a conflict against the Moldovan government. The situation remained relatively stable between the two sides for the first half of 1991, until August 19th when the failed coup of the Soviet military finalized the death of the US. USSR, and the Soviet states began breaking apart into independent states. While Moldova declared independence from the USSR, so did Transnistria. When the leaders of Transnistria began a trip to Kyiv to discuss their own recognition of legitimate statehood, they were arrested by Moldovan police, sparking massive riots. After the Moldovan government was forced to release them, the Transnistrians began looting Soviet weapon stockpiles and organizing more professionally styled militias. Fighting would continue and intensify in 1992 through territorial gains on either side were limited, with an eventual ceasefire arbitered by Russian government. While the ceasefire conceded that the region is still a part of Moldova, it also required a permanent occupation by Russian armed forces for future quote unquote peacekeeping. Transnistria since then has yet to be recognized by any other country in the world, and is still legally part of Moldova according to world governments, with even Russia refusing to recognize their legitimacy. To this day, Transnistria has remained a strange Soviet relic of the 21st century. Their lack of recognition hasn't stopped them from issuing their own passports, creating their own currency, holding elections, and even standing up their own military. While there hasn't been a single shot fired in anger there since Jump by Criss Cross was on the top of the music board, the fact that the territory has been occupied by the Russian military for the last 21 years has prevented Moldova from NATO membership and has put them in a uniquely precarious risk of Russian attack to the rest of their country. Now, Moldova itself is a landlocked nation situated along the southwestern border of Ukraine near the Black Sea, containing only about 2.6 million citizens with roughly half a million living in Transnistria. Right after Russia invaded Ukraine, Moldova was there to take in 430,000 refugees from the war, which is more per capita than any other country. It also contains a number of economically important gas pipelines from the state-owned petroleum company Gazprom. Demographically, 75% of the country identifies as ethnic Romanian, speaking Moldovan, with Ukrainians and Romanians making up the second and third largest groups. Economic growth in the nation has been relatively steady since the early 2000s, but slower than neighboring states. And due to the lack of natural energy resources, has had to almost exclusively rely on Russian and Ukrainian imports for fuel, meaning that they were hit uniquely hard after the invasion. Our correspondent and U.S. Army officer Justin Taylor is here to explain how this combination of geographic location and economic ties is currently creating two problems for Putin. First problem is that oil has been Russia's primary source of income and the crucial economic link that has allowed them to continue funding this war. After the initial 2022 invasion, Russia had to spike up its prices of natural gas, which is a resource Moldova relies for its own economic survival. Because Moldova is a relatively poor country, they were no longer able to afford these more expensive prices 
leading Gazprom to shutting down most of the influx from the pipelines that were going into that country. To help remedy this, Moldova brokered a deal with neighboring Romania to build their own oil pipeline, completely independent of Russia. And since October of 2022, they've continued to broker more deals, which has led to even less gas coming in from Russia. And this decreased reliance on Gazprom means Putin has less money to pay for tanks and new AKs. The second problem that Moldova poses for Russia is that its borders are barely 60 kilometers from the port city of Odessa, which has seen numerous air and missile strikes since the war began, but as it stands is solidly under Ukrainian control. If we look at the current war map between Ukraine and Russia, we can see that Odessa is Ukraine's last major port city. And if Russia was able to seize it, they would effectively landlock the entire country, cutting off Ukraine from the Black Sea. There have been growing talks of a second Russian offensive from the West, which would force Ukraine to fight on a two front war. And this is where Transnistria comes in. While a lot of people are gonna scoff the idea of a Russian invasion of Moldova while all of their forces are currently held up trying to consolidate gains in Ukraine, the current situation is textbook historical example of how Russia initiates an invasion and ultimately how they justify it in the first place. From Georgia in 2008 to Crimea in 2014, the initial steps of a Russian invasion typically begin with an unrest of the ethnic Russian population within a different country's borders. Moldova during its time in the USSR was an early target for Russification, essentially a forced immigration of ethnic Russians into a region that had none previously. And while a large number of Transnistrians immigrated back to Russia after 1992, most of them remained. And 300,000 citizens in Transnistria currently identify as an ethnic Russian, making them the largest majority of people living Living there. The next step in the Russian invasion typically involves influencing a region to break away from their native country or to outright create an overthrow of said government. In February of this year, Ukrainian and Moldovan officials revealed that they had intercepted a Russian plan to orchestrate and overthrow their current Moldovan government. This plan is likely increasing in pace because in 2020, Sandu won Moldova's president election against a pro-Russian incumbent. It has been estimated that the plan was created almost immediately after Moldova was granted EU membership in June of 2022. Their goal was to impose a pro-Russian government over the current pro-Western one. On March 10th, John Kirby, spokesperson for the National Security Council, announced that the US intelligence had assessed that the Kremlin was plotting to topple another European democracy. Russian actors, some of the current ties to Russian intelligence are seeking to stage and use protests in Moldova as a basis to foment and manufacture insurrection against the Moldovan government. But the leaked Moldova strategy reveals the Russian government's perspective, countering the attempts of external actors, primarily the United States, the countries of European Union, and the Republic of Turkey and Ukraine to interfere in internal affairs of the Republic of Moldova to strengthen the influence of NATO and weaken the position of Russian Federation. So from Putin's point of view, NATO is already meddling in Moldova with their own Western Moldova strategy. And the only way for him to stop NATO from influencing the nation is to influence it himself. The Moldova strategy document goes on to lay out how Russia plans to move forward in Moldova, the creation of a network of NGOs promoting the development of Russian-Moldova relations. And they're even planning to expand influence through adding Moldovan students using remote or distance education. Now I feel like I'm in the height of the Red Scare 1950s era and I'm seeing communists everywhere in my serial and my dang Zoom meetings. Ukrainian officials explained that the plan would involve Russian saboteurs attacking and bombing major economic and government buildings, while taking hostages, seizing government officials, and installing a puppet government, and that this would be orchestrated by two Moldovan organized criminal oligarchs that are currently in exile from Moldova. All of this has continued to be reaffirmed by the intelligence agencies in Moldova. The third and final step of Russian invasion would be their intervention in ethnically Russian areas, the exact reasoning they used in Crimea, and the same they would use in Transnistria. The last part, they're not even trying to hide. When during an April 2022 talk, Russian generals stated that they intended on creating a land bridge to Transnistria once they seized control of Odessa, saying that the population is currently being oppressed by the Moldovan government. This is greatly concerning due to an ongoing series of protests in 2022 headed by the pro-Russian SOAR party, a small opposition political party with a strangely Christmas looking logo funded largely by Ilyan Shor, one of the two exiled oligarchs named in the coup plans. Their protests were sparked due to the energy crisis from an aforementioned style of Russian gas. It's a bit ironic that a pro-Russian party would protest the Moldovan government for a problem that Russia caused, but 
we're gonna just roll with it here. A month later, the Russian National Liberation Movement launched protests in the Moldovan region of Galazia, another area that has sought to break away from Moldova in the past. And they announced that they intended to recognize as illegal the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the restoration of borders of the former Soviet Union in accordance with the results of World War II, which is the very definition of bold move, Cotton, we'll see if it plays out for them. The Moldova strategy leaked documents, plans to have the nation join the Russian Eurasian Economic Union and their collective security treaty organization, which is like their own version of NATO. And Moldovan officials are currently seeking laws to criminalize these parties. However, on February 10th of this year, pro-Western Moldova Prime Minister stepped down from power. During the announcement, she said, I took over the government with an anti-corruption, pro-development, and pro-European mandate at a time when corruption schemes had captured all the institutions and the oligarchs felt untouchable. We were immediately faced with energy blackmail, and those who did this hope we would give in. She then appointed the Moldovan defense advisor, Doran Riesen, as her successor. But this has only brought on more accusations of protesters that Moldova was moving towards a NATO puppet state. Now with credible threats of a coup, executive turnovers, anti-government protests, and breakaway regions within their borders, it might still seem improbable that Russia would be capable of effectively organizing a takeover of Transnistria when their entire focus is consolidating gains hundreds of miles away from this region, except for the fact that Russians are already there. Despite decades of claims by Moldova that the presence of Russian troops within their borders should be removed, Russia has refused to pull its forces from the region that have been present in peacekeeping duties since 1992. And in June of 2016, the Transnistrian government made it illegal to even criticize the presence of Russians in the area, carrying with it a possible seven year jail sentence. Do not pass go, do not collect 3,200 rubles. Current numbers of Russian troops hover around 1,500, largely focused around an ammunition depot in Kobazna. Interestingly enough, before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, plans to dissolve and destroy the ammo dump were supported by all parties involved. Though this was less an act of goodwill and more of a practical response to a growing possibility that the aging explosive in the bunker will eventually go off. And studies show that the resulting chain reaction of explosions would be the size of a bomb dropped on Hiroshima. That said, since the breakout of the war, those plans have effectively been shuttered. The Kobazna arsenal was also the source of an isolated drone attack in April of 2022, just a couple of months after the invasion. The Transnistrian blame the Ukrainians while the Moldovan officials claim that they were sent by Transnistria itself as a way for pro-Russian groups to escalate the situation as some sort of accelerationist effort. If you've lost track, I think we're up to at least three false flags at this point. Now with tensions between Moldova and Transnistria higher than ever in the past two decades and the growing threat of Russia to Moldova, it places the country in a difficult situation where there are no really good options here. The entire Moldovan military consists of only about 6,500 active personnel and 2,000 annual conscripts serving a mandatory year-long contract. They currently hold just a handful of armored vehicles, including about 18 BMPs, 10 BRDMs, with a number of BTRs, MLTBS, and Humvees that are officially not operational. While the Moldovan government has continued to push for military modernization, the lack of progress is largely tied to their slow economic development, with their own defense minister announcing that at least 90% of their military equipment would not be effective on a modern battlefield. The situation is so bad that they aren't even able to afford a week's worth of t-shirts for their soldiers. To help remedy this in the wake of the Russian invasion, NATO countries have begun to provide some materials and aid in the forms of first aid supplies, flak jackets, winter clothing, and handful full of cheap drones, but they're far from what would be needed to wage an offensive against an entrenched Russian force of 1,500 soldiers. To make the situation a bit more tenuous, Transnistria has had their own military of 5,500 active personnel and is actually better armed in some areas than the Moldovan military, as they have a number of T-64 tanks, which are wildly outdated by today's standards, but still a tough target considering Moldova doesn't have any tanks to begin with. All this is to say that Moldova has no real military option of forcing the Russians out of the country or preventing them from seizing power in Transnistria. As it stands, Moldova is sitting on military gridlock. Though Russia had plans to seize Transnistria, the plan involving seizing Odessa in the first place doesn't look like it played out and it's not in the cards anymore for them. But that doesn't change the fact that there are at least 1,500 Russians and 5,500 armed Transnistrians sitting on a massive supply ammo depot, which is capable of effectively arming the Transnistrian population to the point of a 
credible threat. On the other hand, those 1,500 Russians are essentially cut off from any meaningful supply routes and just a short distance away from a growing Western defensive effort by Ukraine, essentially putting both sides in a lose-lose situation. Hence why we're seeing an uptick in Russian efforts to politically destabilize the country from within. From what I can gather, it looks like pro-Russian oligarch, sure, is paying protesters to show up for the Kremlin, but at the same time, a lot of these protesters genuinely are angry at the increased financial pressure put on them by their pro-Western government who refuses to reimburse them for the cost of cutting ties with Russia. In a White House statement, President Biden highlighted ongoing US assistance to help Moldova strengthen its political and economic resilience, including its democratic reform agenda and energy security, and to address the effects of Russia's war against Ukraine. And we can expect increased support as the new Moldovan government continues to push for EU alignment while attempting to counteract the effects of energy insecurity and Russian-backed instability. While we can't say for sure how it's gonna play out or what lengths we can expect Russia to go to tip the political scale in their favor or how Moldova and the rest of the world will respond, but it's worth keeping an eye on.